morning, good afternoon, good evening, good luck sleeping. You're watching PNT. I'm your host, Aerodynamically Improbable. Up front this week, according to an article published by the Huffington Post, a young boy in Chelsea, Massachusetts may have saved his life by clinging tightly to his stuffed cow as he tumbled out his second story bedroom window. The two-year-old boy had been jumping on his bed upstairs and inadvertently sailed out through the open window, falling more than 15 feet to a concrete slab below. The terrified tot clutched his stuffed cow tightly and managed to avoid serious injury due to the padding effects of his batting-filled bovine friend. The boy's uncle stated he was shocked to see his nephew fly out of the second-story window. I was paralyzed, the uncle stated. We rushed down to get him. I thank God for everything. He was watching over us. Not forgetting the hero of this story, Police Chief Brian Keyes sent out a tweet showing the lucky stuffed cow. The boy received treatment for some minor abrasions and was held overnight for observation, and the cow no doubt will be restuffed and be fluffier than ever before. From aerial cows to airborne insect appetizers, our next story takes us to Costa Rica, where a politician got more than a mouthful during a recent speech. According to online sources and an article by the Huffington Post, Costa Rican President Luis Guillermo Solis Rivera was giving a speech to local reporters when a wasp flew into his open mouth. Proving himself a true political badass, President Rivera barely paused his speech before turning the tables on the invading insect, chewing and swallowing the wasp before sheepishly announcing to the camera, I ate it, I ate it, I ate the wasp. Nonplussed, the Politico took a drink of water before proclaiming pure protein and continuing the interview. While President Rivera took the incident in stride, the woman in the background seemed far more concerned. Tales que hay en una zona tan importante como esta, que sin embargo me la comí. Me comí la me, me comí la avispa. Eso no se ve todos los días. No se ve todos los días, no, hombre, esto lo mandan, lo mandan, lo mandan a CNN y va a estar bien. Ya la procesó así, ya. No, todavía no. Eso lo van a mandar a CNN. Proteína, proteína pura. <risa> este, no sé dónde digamos, así los proyectos, ¿no? Los debates naturales que hay en una zona tan importante como esta, que sin embargo me la comí. Me comí la, me, me comí la avispa. <risa> los debates naturales que hay en una zona tan importante como esta, que sin embargo me la comí. Viewers took to Twitter to spread the viral footage, and PNT has to agree with user Constance Howard, who stated, I would vote for a guy who could eat wasps and then laugh afterwards. We, however, would like to take it one step further and suggest that wasp eating under pressure be made a prerequisite for all present and future political positions. From wasp eating presidents to time traveling earthquakes, our final story in our weekly roundup of the weird takes us to California, but we aren't entirely certain when. According to posts from the United States Geographical Survey and an article by the Huffington Post, the USGS sent out an automated message on June 21st of this year for a 6.8 magnitude earthquake in the Pacific Ocean 10 miles west of Santa Barbara. Worried residents shared and retweeted the alert expecting rumblings at any time, they were left scratching their heads and fortunately disappointed, however, when the USGS tweeted a retraction and an update. There was, in fact, an earthquake at that location on June 21st, but it had occurred in 1925, not this year. The error in earthquake prediction apparently occurred due to an error in the detection equipment's predictive logarithmic code, prompting officials to scramble to retract the warning before a panic could occur. Their fears seemed to be well-founded as the LA Times briefly published an article stating that the quake had struck. The Times later soon retracted the story, posting the USGS tweet explaining things. While there are no casualties or damage caused by the time-traveling tectonic tantrum, the real 1925 quake devastated early Santa Barbara, completely leveling several buildings and killing over a dozen citizens. 
For our part, PNT is pleased to report this story only as an outlandish oddity and as a remembrance of historical note rather than as an actual modern catastrophe. For that, faithful viewers, one can always turn to politics. And now, PNT is pleased to bring you our weekly report. Made of clear or milky white quartz, they are claimed by some to be pre-Columbian Mesoamerican objects. Believed to contain mystical powers, these strange artifacts present a tantalizing glimpse into the lost and unknown past, and the possible profits to be made from curious collectors. Join PNT as we investigate the strange skullduggery surrounding the Crystal Skulls. 1875 French explorer and ethnographer Alphonse Pinart is browsing through the shop of antiquities dealer Eugene Bobon when he spies a remarkable object. Approximately four inches high, the curious find appears to be a small human skull carved from quartz crystal. Noting its primitive style, Pinart queries Bobon as to its origin. Bobon states that he had acquired it on a dig in Mexico as part of a larger find. He offers to sell the curious Pinar, the skull, along with the rest of the artifacts. Intrigued, Pinar agrees. This will not be the last time that Bobon has something to sell the French explorer. From 1875 through 1877, Pinar purchases the bulk of Bobon's collection of Mexican artifacts, including two additional crystal skulls. The other two skulls were less than two or three inches in size and roughly carved seeming perhaps to be beads. Curiously, this was not the first time that Bobon had tried to exhibit the skulls. As part of the French Scientific Commission in Mexico, Bobon had displayed the skulls as part of the 1867 Paris Exposition. More curious still is the fact that in 1881 a much larger, life-size skull soon appeared in the window of a Parisian antiquities dealer, none other than Eugène Bobon. Oddly, Bobon's catalog lists no location of origin and only describes the skull as a masterpiece of lapidary technology and unique in the world. Despite its purported uniqueness, the skull failed to sell and Bobon took it with him in 1885 when he returned to Mexico. Setting himself up in Mexico City, Bobon exhibited the crystal cranium alongside other human skulls at his Museo Scientifico. Local gossip claims that Boban made a deal with local official Leopoldo Batres, whose title, ironically, was Protector of Pre-Hispanic Monuments. The pair approached Mexico's National Museum and attempted to sell the skull as an Aztec artifact. Suspicious, the museum's curator claimed the skull was a fake made of glass and refused to purchase it. It was at this point whether from anger to save face, that Batres denounced Bobon as a fraud and accused him of smuggling antiquities. Bobon must have managed to smooth things over, or perhaps he was thrown out, for in July of 1886 he moved from Mexico to New York City. Bobon later held an auction of artifacts, manuscripts, books, and of course, the crystal skull. Bobon finally found his buyer when Tiffany and company purchased the skull for $950. It is perhaps no surprise that later that year, Papon's catalog of artifacts once again lists a crystal skull, but this time with crystal hand as well. Listed as Aztec in origin and from the Valley of Mexico, the duo of artifacts remain uncounted for to this day. A decade later, Tiffany and Company sells the skull to the British Museum for the original purchase price. At this point, Eugene Papon disappears into obscurity but the story of the skulls themselves continues, and only gets stranger. In 1934, Sidney Burney, a London art dealer, purchases a skull that is almost identical to the one in the British Museum. While there is no record of where Burney bought the skull, it was in turn sold again in 1943 at a Sotheby's auction. The purchaser, famed British adventurer and author F. A. Mitchell Hedges, was soon to be indelibly connected with the legends surrounding the skull, or more precisely, his adopted daughter, Anna. According to accounts, and despite the Sotheby's auction records, Anna Mitchell Hedges has maintained that she discovered the skull while on one of her father's digs in Belize. Wandering off on her own to explore a temple, 
Anna claimed that she found the skull buried under a collapsed altar. Made from a block of clear quartz in the same approximate size as a real human skull, the authenticity of the object has been examined more than once with varying results. Her father mentions the skull briefly in the first edition of his 1954 autobiography, Danger My Ally, but does not specify where or by whom it was found, only stating that it is at least 3,600 years old, and according to legend it was used by the high priest of the Maya when he was performing esoteric rites. It is said that when he willed death with the help of the skull, death invariably followed. Curiously, this description of the skull was later removed from future editions of the autobiography. The legends around the skull and the strange powers it held only intensified throughout the 1960s and 70s, before finally coming to fruition during the late 1980s, when the crystal skull entered the evolving New Age religious mythos as a potent relic of an ancient, technologically advanced civilization. Anna herself claimed that the Mitchell Hedges skull could cause visions, cure cancer, and even commit murder, fulfilling its ancient role even in these modern times. Anna maintained her story, touring with the skull in 1967 and exhibiting it on a pay-per-view basis to the curious. She repeated this process again in 1989 and continued to grant interviews about the artifact until her death in 2007. Since that time, her husband Bill Homan has maintained ownership of the skull and has provided it for detailed examination in 2007 and again in 2008, allowing anthropologist Jane McLaren Walsh of the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History to obtain UV light, computerized tomography, and finally two sets of silicone molds of suspected tool marks. Later submitted to scanning electron microscope examination, the molds showed clear evidence that the skull had been worked with high-speed hard metal rotary tools, a far cry from the expected ancient techniques involving stone or wooden tools and abrasive sand that pre-Columbian cultures would have utilized. So were the crystal skulls real? or simply a massive hoax perpetrated by an over-eager antiquities dealer. Despite the fascinating possibilities of antediluvian civilizations, mystical powers, and ancient curses, modern examinations carried out by researchers such as Dr. Walsh have conclusively proven that the crystal skulls thus far brought forward are modern in origin, likely dating to the 19th century when a frenzy of interest in ancient cultures was at its peak. Note that PNT stated, those skulls thus far brought forward. It has long been known that other crystal skulls exist, with origin stories just as fascinating as those we have covered here today. Eugene Bobon's forgeries aside, are there pre-Columbian artifacts from an advanced civilization gathering dust in private collections worldwide? Artifacts that if offered for examination might prove once and for all that the true nature of the crystal skulls is beyond the paranormal. The answer, it seems, may never be crystal clear. And so PNT invites you, our faithful viewers, to investigate further and draw your own conclusions. We thank you for watching and ask that you click like, share, and subscribe below. I'm your host, reminding you to keep an open mind because a closed one shuts out the truth.